Welcome to the 11 o'clock session on this Thursday of the Oklahoma Library Association Conference. Um, we right now have Elizabeth Skirpin Estes with us to talk about project management. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Emily. My name is Elizabeth Skirpin Estes, and I'm the Director of Bibliographic Services at the University of Tulsa McFarland Library. And this is project management for the unofficial library project manager. So today we're going to really spend the first half of the presentation talking about key project management concepts, things that you're probably going to hear thrown around a lot when we're discussing project management. And the second half of the presentation is going to be really specific to libraries. As a couple of quick housekeeping points, um, please feel free to ask questions as we go and I'll answer as I see them in the comments. And copies of the slides and uh, handouts are going to be on the breakout session page that you logged into to get to this session. So there will be my slides with um, any resources, URLs, all that good stuff, as well as a couple of handouts. And before we really jump into this, I really want to emphasize that project management is a really big field of study with so many, many, many years of research behind it. And there's so many different takes on how to apply it to your environment based on the field that you're working in. We could legitimately spend every second of today talking about project management and really not even scrape the surface of this massive, massive field of study. So we're really gonna focus today on just some key concepts that I think are important for libraries to understand when they're managing projects. And then we're gonna really discuss some applicable things that you can leave this presentation today and start applying in your own library when you're managing projects. So some common project management misconceptions are that only big businesses or large libraries can use project management principles for their multi-million dollar projects, or that you need a project management professional, a PMP certification, or that you need to hire a staff member who does. And another one is that project management is too complicated or that it utilizes too many tools. And again, with 40 plus years of study, this is not incorrect. There are a lot of tools and techniques when managing projects. Project management is a trend that will eventually go away, or that every element of project management needs to be utilized in every single one of my library projects. So there are some struggles with project management for many libraries, and I think one of the biggest ones is that managing a project with pure project management principles is probably going to be overkill unless you are managing a massive system-wide, multi-million, multi-billion dollar project that's gonna vastly change your library system. Project management as a study is jargon and tool heavy. If you pick up the official text on project management, it's called the PMBOK, and it is hundreds and hundreds of pages of theories, terminology, charts, things that you're supposed to memorize and utilize in order to sit for the PMP exam. And I think in many cases that is going to be drastic overkill for many of our libraries. Um, utilizing project management practices can be a hard sell to some of your supervisors. I think the big question that some supervisors will have is why? We've never done this before. Why should we start now? And then meanwhile, other supervisors may be drawn in by the project management trend that's sort of upticking, especially in libraries and archives right now. And they may want their libraries to fully embrace all aspects of project management, which as I said on the previous slide, there are so many years of study and so many tools for this, and that might be overkill in many cases. And many libraries are already managing projects, so why utilize these principles to manage projects when you haven't previously? So the benefit of project management principles is that they're highly adaptable and they're a la carte. You don't have to use what you don't need and you can utilize only what you do need, what's going to benefit you during the project management process. And project management principles are rooted in the study of well-managed projects and project best practices. So something that I've really enjoyed about learning about project management as a field and as a practice is that you get to learn from the mistakes of others. You get to hear those sort of stories, especially from other libraries saying, you know, we mismanaged a $7.9 million library redesign project, so don't do this. And so you sort of get to learn what other people have done that has worked or has not worked, especially in the field of librarianship, and then utilize that going forward. You don't have to make the mistake yourself or trip yourself and then pick yourself back up. You can anticipate that you might hit certain pitfalls as you're managing a project and you then can avoid those pitfalls going forward. There are also a plethora of free tools and templates intended for large projects online. I found them for libraries. I've just found blank templates that I can cut and paste. I've found free project plans that I can move around and really make work for my field or my specific project that I'm working on at that time. I don't have to invent anything from the ground up. And you can use the principles of project management as guidelines 
and just sort of look at the research that is out there rather than inventing it yourself from the ground up, as I've mentioned. And project management centers around details, working with others, and meeting goals and deadlines. And these are all things that we do every single day in working with libraries. And it really helps you from not dropping the ball when you're managing money or you have a high stakes project that really needs to be managed well. So some of the terminology we're going to cover today includes project, project management, project constraints, scope, stakeholders, team members, project plan, and documentation. So project management, what is it? I'm sure you've heard this thrown around so many times in so many different ways, some of them correctly, some of them incorrectly. But some of the official definitions include that a project is a temporary, and that temporary part of that is incredibly important. So a project is a temporary endeavor in that it has defined beginning and end in time, and therefore a defined scope and resources. A project is unique in that it is not a routine operation, but a specific set of operations designed to accomplish a singular goal. So for example, if you have a project to increase circulation at your library, it involves taking specific steps to amplify your circulation statistics through a specific research and implementation process. It is not just saying we're going to increase circulation and then you work on that perpetually. It's a temporary endeavor that you are undertaking. Project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to meet the project requirements. And there is much debate about whether a project can or cannot do and how involved project managers should be in the project management process. Some people think that project managers should be proactive while others think that they should be subdued. In reality, it depends on the project. You will have projects in which you need a project manager to sort of oversee every little component of the project. And in other projects, your project manager is going to sort of supervise the project as a whole, but they may not have much day-to-day -day impact or influence within the project itself. So steps to, pre to plan a project. And really, as I go through these, you're going to recognize that these are the five steps that we all use to plan a project, regardless of how big or how small, and whether or not you've recognized that these are the steps that we're utilizing. So the steps are generally universal. And as I mentioned, you have probably utilized them before, and it's going to begin with project initiation or the kickoff. So we've recognized that we have a problem, and we have decided that we are going to undertake a project to solve that problem. Then the next phase is project planning. And I think this is perhaps the hardest, and it's definitely the lengthiest part of, pro of project management and planning a project. During this process, you're going to plan from every single person, vendor, dollar spent, um, the work that needs to be done in order to get from point A to point B, uh, what the end result is going to look like. How are we going to determine that the project has been successful or that it has done something beneficial, fix the problem that we've decided to address? And then you're going to decide also who needs to sign off on the project, who are your stakeholders, which we'll get to those in just a moment and what everyone's role will be in both implementation, execution, and closing of this project. Oops. We have a pop-up there. I'll stop for just a second. I'm not, oh, there we go. Okay, it's needed again. Back on track. So project execution is that you've planned, and now it's project time. Project monitoring and control. Are we on track? Are we on budget? And are we only doing the work that we promise, which we will also get to that. That's another important piece. And lastly, project closure. The project is completed. We filed our relevant documentation in a place where our stakeholders can find or we can find ourselves at a later point in time. And the project's been signed off on. We will no longer work on the project. It's done. And I think this is perhaps the most um, referenced either diagram or principle or theory in project management. And so to the right side of my slide, I have a uh, photo of a triangle and it's called the triple constraint triangle in project management. And at the top of the triangle on the northernmost tip, you will see that it says budget slash cost. The rightmost tip says time slash schedule. The leftmost tip says scope. And the center of the triangle says quality. 
And so what this is really saying is, as I mentioned before, that projects are temporary and they must end. That is really, really important in project management. But the triple constraint theory in particular says that every project operates within the boundaries of time, scope, and cost. A change in one of these factors is going to affect the other two. And so the best example in how to describe this is sort of, if we have more money in our project, we can increase the project scope, we can expand what we're going to do, and we can shorten our timeline, whether that is um, hiring more staff to help us work on the project, paying overtime, hiring an outside vendor that can help us. If we stay within the project scope, we can stay in budget and stay on schedule. So if we're not expanding what we're doing, we're not going to have additional unanticipated costs and we can stay on our projected timeline or schedule that we set at the beginning of this project. And if we need more time in order to do our project, the budget is probably going to suffer because we have employees' salaries that have to be paid over time, whatever the case may be. And so this is very important in project management as we get into the project plan. And this is why, as we discuss scope creep going forward in a couple more slides, that it is so important that we just do what we said we were going to do and we do it in the timeline that we say we're going to do it. And we do it with the amount of money that we have been given in order to do a project. If you really creep outside of any one of these factors, it's going to impact the rest of the project and throw something else off. So project scope refers to the detailed set of deliverables or features of a project. These deliverables are derived from a project's requirement. So back in the project either execution phase or the project planning phase, we have said that we are going to take steps one, two, three, and four in order to solve a project. And so when we are discussing scope creep, I think a popular example is sort of an example um, in cataloging that comes to mind is that we said we are going to fix the DVD collection. And while we are fixing the DVD collection and we've assigned man hours and resources in order to do that, someone says, oh, while you're doing the DVD collection, can you also do the graphic novels collection? And that's going to throw off both our budget and our timeline in order to create, in order to complete our initial project. So this is the work that needs to be accomplished in order to deliver a product, service, or result with the specified features and functions. And I think most importantly, it's the work that we promise to do to fix the problem, and it's nothing more and nothing less. If we sort of take on other mini projects or problems as we're trying to solve our initial problem, we're going to sort of fall off the bandwagon of getting things done on time and on budget. And it informs the project scope statement, which does prevent scope creep um, going forward. So people are another big component of project management. And the two groups of people that we commonly discuss are stakeholders. So someone who's invested in the project or who to, or excuse me, or who derives value from the outcome of the project and your team. And your team members with their skills and their specialty roles within the project are gonna be vital for project success. So stakeholders, examples could be city councilors, your customers or your patrons, your employees, supervisors, library administration. You could have a singular donor who is incredibly involved in your library and wants to know every little thing that you're gonna do in terms of projects, where money's going, et cetera. If the project, um, or excuse me, and so the first task of the project manager should be to identify stakeholders and their responsibility. So who are these individuals? What is their stake in this project and the project being completed? And wh what do we really need to do to include them in this process to make sure that they're being notified, that we're communicating with them, et cetera? And your team, um, so selecting your team, if you do have that option, which you may not, and we'll get to that shortly, is vital for project success. We wanna make sure that if we have a project involving IT, that we are involving our employees with sort of a technology background, not necessarily our employees who don't have that background. Um, which isn't to say that you can't include people on your projects that are excited to learn or that they have other strengths that they bring to the table. But we're making sure that we're selecting team members that have a proclivity to do the work that has to be done in order to complete the project. And you may or may not have any say on who's working on your projects. It's pretty common, especially in the IT field and the military field, that you are sort of assigned a team and you have to work with what you have. Um, and they may, 
in terms of that not report to you directly. So if you are in a supervisory position and you have a team member who's not doing the work that they're supposed to, you have the direct ability to talk to this individual and say that they need to do what they were assigned to do in a timely manner, correctly, whatever the case may be. If that person doesn't report to you, you may not have that power to sit them down and say that they're not fulfilling their project roles. And you may have to involve other people in that project. So you may not always be able to hold people accountable. And this is where conflict management and soft skills come in, which is not specific to projects alone. I think this is important in any role in the library, in any role in projects in general. But you may be working with diverse teams who did not answer to you in your reporting structure, as I mentioned previously. And as such, conflict management is going to be a big focus of the project manager as they're overseeing a project. So groups working on the project may have different goals and expectations. So if you are working to increase circulation in your library, your folks working on the circulation end of things are really there to increase circulation. Your folks working on the technical services end of things may be reviewing maybe how they're cataloging so that books can be easier found by our patrons. And so you're going to have two different goals there. One is going to be simply to increase circulation numbers and the other is going to be to improve or revise cataloging practices. There may be considerable uncertainty about who has the authority to make decisions. And I think especially in libraries, sometimes we have library teams that are very excited to undertake a project and they're willing to take that on themselves. So you may not necessarily, as you're making decisions, have a singular person with the authority to say, yes, we can spend more money here or yes, we can bring this person on the team. And there may also be interpersonal conflicts between your stakeholders. If you have a supervisor that is at ends with a library donor, that is going to sort of be a tricky dance to dance because your supervisors might have certain expectations, your stakeholder donor might have different expectations, and the two expectations might conflict with one another. And then you're sort of in this conflict management role where you're trying to appease both sides and come to a conclusion with two individuals who don't like each other. And the sort of gist of this slide is that soft skills really matter. They really matter whether you're managing projects and they really matter if you are just serving in any sort of library function within your library. Soft skills, especially effective communication, are essential for all project managers, whether you're working with stakeholders, your team, your own supervisor, or your customers. You're going to have to know how to speak to different types of people who approach problems and situations differently. And you're going to have to learn how to balance between all your various stakeholders and their expectations and communication. Being able to recognize who's going to be essential to complete a project on time, on budget, and well is also critical in this, but being able to work with diverse personalities in and outside of your library are also going to be important. Good project managers recognize that the various stakeholders and team members in and outside of the organization uh, that they exist and they work hard to include those various individuals in each step of the project. Transparency, communication, and solicitation of advice from all your various stakeholders and project participants are going to be really good soft skills to master. And I think there's a lot of questions sometimes when we're discussing soft skills and when we are discussing how to improve those soft skills, there's so many opportunities to learn about conflict resolution. And you can consider asking your team to partake in personality tests such as the Myers-Briggs, the True Colors, et cetera. You can investigate how each individual likes to be contacted and how often. And I really recommend that you interview your stakeholders and your team members to ask about their perceived role within the project and their own preferences for communication. So now we're getting into to the project management specific to libraries part of this presentation. So project plans and relevant documentation are essential and we'll get more into depth in that here in just a moment, but this is perhaps the most critical part of project management for libraries specifically. Tools and jargon are optional. You can manage this as if you have read the PMBOK cover to cover and read the PMBOK cover to cover if that's what you so choose to do, but you don't have to. And I really think that we can learn just some critical points and some critical details from project management as a field of study without having to implement the various charts and the very in-depth work structures within managing projects. 
You can use what you need, but you don't overcomplicate what you don't have to. So going back to that previous comment, you can sort of pick and choose what is going to work for you as a project manager or what is going to work for your library's projects. But I really recommend that you don't overcomplicate it. You just use the simplest structure or simplest tool, map, diagram that works for you. And then just don't make it super complicated for what you're doing. Super complicated means that sometimes we're forgetting the details, which are important. And last but not least, don't forget your people in this. We all have deadlines we have to meet. We all have projects that have to be completed. We all have problems to solve, but don't forget that you have people either working under you, next to you, above you, or outside of the library on behalf of the library that need to be involved in this process. So I really think that the project plan is the most critical part of project management for libraries. So once you've identified the problem and the team who's going to address the problem and then the stakeholders that the problem and solution impact, as well as information about your budget, deadlines, et cetera, then you can begin the project plan. So according to projectmanagement.com, a project plan is the contract between the project manager, the executive sponsor, so the person signing off on this, the project team, and other management of the enterprise associated with or affected by the project. This document is going to organize the project and details that all, and it, excuse me, details all the important information about the project for those working on the project or wanting to know more about that. So going back to one of the examples of redesigning a library, say that we're going to remodel our library system as a whole, every library within that system is going to get a facelift, new furniture, new paint, all that good stuff. You may have community stakeholders who are very curious about how much is this going to cost? Are you using local vendors to complete the work? How are you making decisions on which furniture to buy? How do I know that you're not buying the $2,000 chair and misusing taxpayer money? Or why did you buy the $200 chair? Is that soft seating going to survive long-term in the library? And so as such, a project plan can range from a single page document to massive 30 plus page documents, depending on the project plan that the library chooses to use as their template, or depending on the size and the breadth of the project itself. However, these project plans generally are going to include the same information. So popular components of the project plan are sort of the purpose or the background. This is a really great place within your project plan to say, we interviewed our community members and they really decided that our library was outdated. We didn't have enough computer terminals for all of our patrons to utilize at our busiest times. Our carpeting was stained and we had some mold spots in various places. And ultimately with the push of our community really decided that this is a necessary project. And we have the relevant research to back it up, such as interviewing community members, holding focus groups, distributing surveys, or even asking peer library systems. Um, perhaps you have a library system very close to your own library system and your customers are going to that library system because they feel that it is newer, nicer, whatever the case may be. So what are our goals and our objectives in this project? Is it going to be um, replace carpet, paint, and add new electronics in the buildings? Is it going to be hire a new library director for this library that can oversee modernization or implement new technology? Um, hire new staff members that maybe can help with the design process or whatever that case may be. So your scope, as we've mentioned previously, is what you promise you're going to do and nothing more and nothing less. So I recommend that you write your scope statement as inclusively as possible. So if, for example, we just sort of write a quick little scope statement saying we promise to remodel the libraries. What does that specifically entail? And so we're going to say we are going to remodel the libraries and this remodel will include paint, new carpets, new computer terminals, um, new technology in the way of a 3D printer and a maker space. You're just going to be as specific as possible within that statement, but make sure that it includes things that you are likely to do along the way. So if that also includes replacing doorknobs, for example, that also needs to go in that scope statement. So we're all on the same page about exactly what is happening. And then once you've written that scope statement, your deliverables are what you sort of promise to deliver. And it's typically a 
bullet pointed list. And so above, if we've said we are going to remodel and it is going to include X, Y, and Z, now your deliverables are bullet pointed going to say X, Y, and Z. Your constraints may be, for example, um, very relevant today, coronavirus. So only so many of us can go into the library at a time, but we have to bring in our staff members to ask for input before we make design decisions or perhaps there are financial constraints. We only have $5,000 per library in order to accomplish this remodel. So there's definitely going to have to be some corners cut in order to undertake a remodel at every single library with limited funds. Um, time is usually a big constraint in projects. So typically when you say we're going to remodel a library, people wanna know exactly how long is the library gonna be closed and exactly when is it going to open again. So you might be on a very tight schedule which rolls us right into our schedule or our milestones. Um, and on one of my handouts, I believe it was my project management chart of the multi-page one. It does include both a section for a schedule. So you can sort of say in the month of August, we're going to close the library and begin pulling carpet. In the month of September, we're going to start painting and changing doorknobs. And in the month of October, we're going to bring in new technology and install it. And then we will open November 1st, would just be your schedule. And your milestones comparatively could be along the lines of, you know, phase one, we are going to close the library and pull the various pieces out of the library, move our book collections out so they don't get damaged. Phase two could be the remodel phase and it includes carpet installation, and it includes new pain and phase three would be reopening. And sometimes you'll see these mashed together as your milestone is sort of a phase one, phase two, phase three, and then the specific schedule pertaining to that milestone is listed underneath that. So your budget, if applicable, and sometimes, especially when I am managing projects within the technical services world, our budget is not really a nickel and dime budget like you would expect to see in a massive remodel with so many community individuals involved in it. So that doesn't really pertain to us, but we may have different constraints pertaining to finances, such as we need to revisit the DVD collection and reprocess some materials that were processed poorly several years ago, but I only have 30 DVD cases. So maybe we have to pick the 30 worst DVDs in order to reprocess those. So risk assessment, if necessary, and this could include safety. Um, we definitely wanna be aware of the safety of the individuals working in the building if we're going to have our building open and remodel simultaneously. It could be financial risk. Maybe the library is on the verge of closing and this $5,000 remodel is really the make or break between the library opening or not opening. It could include, um, I think vendor delivery is a big one that I tend to worry about. So it is a risk if I say that I will have this project completed in two months, but some Sometimes my vendors don't get my orders, to, excuse me, to me within that amount of time. So that's definitely a risk that I won't complete my project on time if I can't depend on my vendors to deliver on time. The work breakdown structure, it's called the WBS. And the work breakdown structure can definitely be blown out of proportion in a project management process. And when you're dealing with you know, hundreds of employees, vendors, stakeholders within a project, a WBS is incredibly important. And so a WBS can look very different depending on the template that the organization is using. Um, Microsoft Project actually creates a WBS for you. And more or less, it is a list of individuals and the tasks that they will complete with the time frame that they have to complete that task. And so there are often times in a project where one individual has to complete a certain task before we can move on to the next task at hand. So in the remodel phase of that, maybe we wanna paint first and then replace the carpet so we don't damage the new carpet. So we definitely have to wait on the painters to finish painting before the carpet installers can install the carpet. And so those are dependent on one another. But generally I find that especially in smaller projects or projects with not many individuals on it, that a full blown work breakdown structure is totally unnecessary. And you can spend a lot more time nickel and diming who's going to do what on a specific day of the week at the specific time during the week than you really need to. So I recommend that if you're managing massive projects that you take the time to look into work breakdown structures and the free or paid resources that are available to you if you would like to put together a WBS, but generally they're not going to be necessary. 
Then there is a team contact directory on your form. So who's involved? What's their phone number? What's their email? What is their preferred method of communication? Um, maybe they don't want to be called after 5 p.m. And last but not least, the approval sign-off form. So your supervisor overseeing this project um, will sign off on this at the very end and say, I've approved the work, we are considering the project complete and done, and everyone's done what they're supposed to do to a satisfactory nature. And so this is an example of a project charter that I've used previously. And there is a copy of this handout back on the previous page and on my website that will be listed at the end of this presentation. But as you'll see, this is just page one, but it sort of says what's the name, who's sponsoring the project. So it may be your direct supervisor or the city council, maybe the executive sponsor is giving you the authority to undertake this project. Does it align with the strategic plan? So that's really important, especially in academic environments to align every single thing that we do to the greater plan of the university. So if it does directly align to a university's strategic plan, let's make sure that we input that for our stakeholders. And what's going to be the impact of the project? What's going, what is it going to fix? Who is it going to impact? Um, what is gonna be the expected outcome? And then you'll see the project team and their contact information in here. And then a section for a project scope statement at the very teeny tiny edge there, you'll see deliverables. But this goes on for several pages and allows for you to input great detail about the schedule of the project, the timeline, um, risk assessment, and who is going to sign off on the project. This is a totally different project charter that I've used previously. And this one is intended to be a one page project charter rather than being a multi page project charter that you have to flip through piece by piece. It's a one stop shop at a glance of your project and every little piece in it. And so you may find that if you have a very quick project to undertake that this is the best way for you to sort of outline what's the point of the project, who's involved in the project, what's our schedule, how are we gonna communicate with each other, such as how often are we gonna have meetings, who's responsible for what, et cetera, et cetera. And as you sort of look around and poke around for free project management resources online, you'll find hundreds of examples of these. And I really find that putting together your own based off of other examples is incredibly helpful. And I find that you can sort of build your own framework based off of your own reporting system or the sort of projects that you as an individual are going to undertake in a specific part of the library. So why plan your projects? Why go to all the time and effort of putting everything together before you even launch into the project? And I think that planning focus you, excuse me, planning forces you to really address everything from your time constraints to your budget to every single task or problem that needs to be conquered in order to complete the project. You don't drop the ball when you take the time to sit down and decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and who's going to do it. And planning is not only where we're going, but it's where we've been. So when we are planning our projects and we're creating these project plans and documentation and a project charter, it really gives us a file to reference at a later time. So when we are trying to decide, you know, who decided to stick a giant chandelier in the foyer and now, you know, every time we have a rainstorm, we're scared it's gonna fall on someone. We can revisit that. And there's certainly more happy examples of why we can revisit our project plans. And that rules into that proper planning can save us money. There's no surprises when you take the time to sit down and say who's gonna be involved, which vendors are we going to use, how much money do we have? And it allows you to sort of reuse work that you've done previously. So say that we are going to bolster several areas of our collection this upcoming year. And we do one community survey with a couple of focus groups on what our collection is missing. Rather than redo a focus group and a community survey multiple times in the same year to determine what we need to bolster within our library collections, we can review the previous project plan to look at our community survey results and utilize those. And certainly if you feel that they are not applicable to the project at hand or that they are not complete enough for the current project at hand, you can redo that process. But rather than just assuming it needs to be redone the first time, we can look at the work that we've already done. And proper planning can 
Oh, excuse me, I said that. So also proper planning and planning well sets a precedent. And the precedent is that we're paying attention to details. We're spending our money wisely. We're asking the right people to work on our library changing projects. And we're transparent about what we're doing and why we're doing that. And that's so important when you have community stakeholders or outside funds being utilized within your library. Additionally, we're looking at the project as a whole, and that includes the best individuals to complete the work selected, but we're not just focusing on the little pieces in order to complete the project. We're looking at it as an entire thing that has to be dealt with and that has a whole bunch of moving parts within it. And within this process, no one is left out. So we're taking the time to sit down with our project team and say, who is this project going to impact? Who are our stakeholders that have a lot of stake, you know, for lack of a better word, within this project that we're doing in our library? And we have actively sought out every group or individual that this may impact, and we're inviting them into the relevant stages of our planning process in order to get feedback and more information going forward. And there's equal emphasis on the problem we're trying to solve and the details necessary to complete the project. So project planning frames the tasks as steps necessary in order to solve the problem. So one is necessary to complete the other and the work that we do along the way does not stand alone. It's not little tiny one-off tasks that we're doing. We're working towards a greater goal. And perhaps most importantly, documentation. It's really important that we take the time to document our decisions made and money spent and why when we are utilizing someone else's money or even our own budget that's assigned to us. So an example of this, and I have managed many, many projects over the years using this framework, but I think perhaps the most relevant for several libraries, regardless of the type of library, is building an LGBTQ plus collection within your library. So the problem at hand that we're trying to solve is that our library does not have an LGBTQ collection or we need to purchase additional titles. So our staff sits down and they decide that the solution is that we can dedicate a portion of our library budget to collecting in this area. Perhaps we sort of have some discretionary funds that they every year we just assign them to a certain part of the collection that needs to be bolstered. And so this year, as opposed to buying, say, romance fiction, instead we're going to buy LGBTQ plus titles. And then the project plan explains why we need to do this, who's asking for it within our community, our library, or our library staff, exactly where is the money coming from, how much money are we going to use, who is going to be working on the project, where will the books live, or how will they be highlighted now that we spent the money to acquire them, and who's going to approve the project. And so much of project planning is not just being good stewards of our resources, but sometimes justifying the actions taken. So it's very important that you take the time to think about why you're doing something and who it's going to impact and sort of anticipate questions that may be asked of you before they're even asked. And I think in terms of an LGBTQ plus collection, there's often community members that are concerned about why we're doing this, who's paying for it, what suffered in order to do this. And our project plan documents all of this very well. And it's a very great resource for you as a library to sort of have a singular stance on why we've chosen to do what we've done and here's how we've done it. So documentation as the key piece shows that we've demonstrated um, why we're doing something through research and feedback. And it shows that we have a problem to solve. It also satiates stakeholders. They know exactly where the money's going, why the decisions are being made, and why. It promotes good stewardship of resources. So for example, if I decide to buy a $1,000 chair over a $200 chair, specifically when I received those two quotes back, why did I go with the $1,000 chair over the $200 chair? It acts as a reference guide for all team members and stakeholders to outline, or excuse me, outline our milestones, steps, costs, the scope, and the deadlines during the project. So it's sort of a one-stop shop why are we doing what we're doing? How are we doing it? When are we going to do it? And it can be referenced later when we have questions about what phase of our project are we in or where is the money coming from? So project management and libraries, what can it specifically do for you? You can create a framework for all your projects, big and small, and I think that that project charter slash project plan is a great place to start. So you can sort of create a template that really, as we're managing projects going forward, we can say this project really needs to tie back into our um, 
library statements on how we're going to grow or progress this year or community goals or academic goals on our um, various tasks that the university wants to complete in a year. So creating a framework is time consuming, especially when you first create a framework, but a completed framework work will account for all your stakeholders, team members, library or institutional rules and regulations, state or, mu or municipal, excuse me, that's a difficult word to say today, um, requirements, et cetera. And a good framework should prevent you from overlooking important details both now and later. So once we've taken the time to really say, who do we have to answer to and how do we have to answer to them? We don't have to do that again in future projects. It's time consuming up front, but not going forward. And you can use this framework as a standard for all your future projects. So you know what to expect, but so do your stakeholders. They know that there's a single document that lives on the library's website that they can look at when they want to know how a project is progressing or what are the steps in order to complete the project. Your employees will really have a good feel for, you know, how are we managing projects? How will I find out about what the next phase of the project is? What is our budget? Your team members and mates will also understand what's going on. Your community will have a better understanding of the project process, as will other outside organizations, including vendors who may want to give you proof of concepts or demonstrations. Um, and so I personally use a variation of the framework that I started using about four years ago, and I was utilizing it heavily in a technical services environment. And I found that really along the way, my staff was really discovering that they, they understood the project planning process. There were no surprises. We would have a sit down meeting to plan the project. Then we would have a meeting to review our sort of project planning process where it was, the documents that we came up with in order to act as our plan or our charter, and then they knew to sort of work off of that. A project plan um, and project management protects you and your staff and team. So sort of referring back to the LGBTQ collection or remodel decisions, et cetera, you have thorough documentation compiled in a singular location that you can refer back to as long as you need to. And it acts as a project planning checklist. So what do you need to account for and what conversations do you need to be having along the way in addition to what's the money to spend and who's going to be working on this? So what does project management in libraries look like? A good project management plan in libraries and good project management in libraries in general really looks like open communication and transparency, thorough documentation, planning projects before they begin and making sure to plan them well. Creating an environment where we work together to utilize our best skills in order to accomplish a shared goal. So, you know, sort of hearkening back to picking the people with certain proclivities to work on our projects that align with those proclivities. And explaining why decisions were made and showing as well that we're doing our research ahead of time. We're not just deciding to do something. Project management pitfalls to avoid. So keep in mind throughout this process is now that you have your nifty framework and it works really well and your staff knows what to expect, that your framework is going to look different from other frameworks at different institutions. So a framework in general is not a one size fits all project plan. And even if you have a well-established framework, it may not work for every single project and not every single project needs a framework. So if we are you know, quickly relabeling a collection from green stickers to red stickers, you probably don't need a project plan for that, but you probably do need to still communicate with your team that so-and-so is gonna be responsible for this. So that framework isn't gonna work for every single project in your library. And you may need to expand the framework depending on the project at hand. Your project planning process may have to change along the way. And so some projects are going to require additional tools or, you know, more project management concepts on what we've covered today or than what you've previously used in order to accomplish the project. And lastly, be aware of scope creep, as we've discussed previously, but also be aware of project management creep. Just because you are a project manager overseeing a project doesn't mean that we have to utilize the full suite of project management tools and techniques. We can pick and choose as we go, but we don't need to overcomplicate things. That doesn't help us and it doesn't help our teammates. 
And so what can you do today to become a Stellar Library Project Manager? I really encourage you to investigate soft skills and identify common library stakeholders. So who are the same groups of people that always have an issue with what we're doing or they're just very involved in what the library is doing? Who needs to approve our projects as we go? And who is the library project going to impact anytime we do a library project? Consider creating or borrowing a project template that you can use for future projects. And I always remind people to steal, steal, steal rather than buy, buy, buy. Um, make sure you ask your peer libraries what they're utilizing. Google it. Ask library programs that teach project management. There are a couple across the country now. And you might be able to reach out to them and ask for some tips and tricks to get you started. Identify a safe place to store your project information. So now that we're in agreement that a project plan is important and is perhaps the most critical piece for libraries going forward, make sure that you're storing that information in a safe place that you can access it, stakeholders can access it, and your team members can access it that is not your desktop, so it can be deleted or disappeared when we need it most. Talk to your employees or your supervisor about how project management practices regarding documentation or project planning is valuable. Um, and don't forget along the way that, you know, we don't have to do what other libraries are doing with project management. We don't have to do what the Project Management Institute is doing with project management. Really emphasize that good planning is important, but that we don't have to do what everyone else is doing, which I think is really a relief for some supervisors who are maybe looking at project management as a field and getting very overwhelmed very quickly. And consider looking into other project management practices to see what fits in your library. Because I don't specifically use a work breakdown structure in my library does not mean that you don't need one in yours. So take a look at the field as a whole and really see what works for you and sort of leave the things that don't work for you. So thank you so much today for attending. I know I've hit you with so, so, so many things at once, um, but here's my email. Please feel free to call me at or excuse me, email me at any time and I will be happy to help you as best as I'm able. And I've also included the link to my website which includes other project management based presentations, some examples of projects that I have managed before and some templates. And I am now happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was really yeah. great. It sounds like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like there's um, questions coming at the moment. Oh, except for a link to the slides in the chat. I can copy and paste that and get that in there. That's for sure. Um, and also for, for attendees, I put a link to the um, evaluation form for the conference in to chat as well. And let me get that link here. Here are the links to the slides and handout that Elizabeth has on her slide currently. There's the Google Sites link I just put in chat. Does anyone have any questions? It looks like most people are just saying lots of great info. There's a <laughs> lot to chew on there. Absolutely. This is really good. It's very, it's, it's difficult taking 40 plus years of a very <laughs> research field and, you know, dissolving it down into 27 slides. But here yeah, we are. Yeah. And we're all <laughs> mostly here together. Well, you did a very, very good job. Thank you. Yeah, but it doesn't look like any questions. So thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks to all of you for attending. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it.